Kia ora koutou. Welcome everyone to today's Art Bite. Uh, these happen every Friday uh, starting at 12 noon, except in the school holidays and on a public holiday. And today we are in fact uh, live streaming this um, because we're slightly short on space inside this gallery. Um, so for those who um, are self-isolating or have not made it to the gallery today, we are um, giving this opportunity for you to listen and view from the comfort of your own home or office. So today I present, um, I introduce uh, Tim Jones, our librarian and archivist uh, on uh, the staff here. And uh, Tim Jones, um, I'll hand over to you now and you can introduce the work and also maybe explain the live streaming process further. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Rebecca. If I could explain the live streaming process, I'd be uh, very pleased. I, uh, do, I hardly understand it myself, but we'll do our best. Uh, yeah, so this is a bit of an experiment, and uh, uh, just within the last few minutes, I've learned that the Auckland Art Gallery is closed for, for some time. So uh, I hope not to sound like uh, Captain Von Trapp at the Salzburg Festival saying that this may be quite a while till I see you all again. But uh, yeah, no, times are difficult and we hope that this uh, experiment that we're doing now uh, is successful and um, uh, that you're able to enjoy this a little talk from wherever you happen to be. So behind me you can see uh, Sidney Love Thompson's uh, painting, uh, Our Bridge Over the Canal Grasse. Uh, I was going to talk first of all a little bit about uh, Sidney Love Thompson, born 1877 in uh, Oxford, uh, in North Canterbury. His father was a grocer, a general merchant trader, and then later on a farmer, also in North Canterbury. Uh, in uh, 1895, he had what is uh, described uh, uh, as a turning point. He had a bit of a road to Damascus thing. He wasn't uh, uh, experienced in, in the visual arts, he, but he came to Christchurch and he saw an exhibition by Petrus van der Velden. Uh, for those of you who are in the room, you can see Petrus van der Velden paintings all around you. For those of you at home, you can't, you're going to have to look at them on our website. Uh, but uh, Sidney Thompson uh, went to Christchurch, saw uh, this uh, show in, uh, at the CSA, and uh, he describes the experience of seeing that show uh, in these uh, words, um, in the part of Canterbury we lived in, oil paintings were unknown, and when I saw this group of Van's work, I was, as the, saying, as the saying goes, knocked right off my feet. He almost immediately then applied for art school and attended the Canterbury College School of Arts from 1895 to 1897. Um, Oh, there's another little quote here I will read you. Uh, the, the experience of visiting Van der Velden's studio uh, was um, uh, very significant because it was the first time he, he had any idea of what a professional artist's studio looked like. He had been at, at the CSA, at the Canterbury College School of Art, uh, they tended to uh, paint, they'd be drawing cones or, or hands, plaster casts of hands and that sort of thing. But Van der Velden very much, re very much recommended that he should sort of let it all hang out and and uh, paint from the soul and uh, and be uh, and think about his own personal expression and his own personal reaction to things. Uh, visiting an, a proper artist studio, a European and slightly, but I think it's fair to say, eccentric Europeans artists studio, uh, made him say this: Van had a studio built in the orchard. This contained two studios, really. The master worked in one, and we students had the other. Van's studio was, in a, was a sanctuary into which we entered with great reverence. I shall always remember the first impression it made on me, one which increased as time went on. One seemed to step from the streets of Christchurch into another world. Um, so there we are. Now, his, in 1898, Van der Velden left New Zealand and very shortly afterwards uh, Thompson went on his first trip to Europe. Now I've had to write this down because his trips to and from Europe for the rest of his life are, uh, well they're hard to remember, um, there are many of them and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll whistle through them. Uh, 
1900 to 1905, he was in Europe. 5 to 11 in New Zealand. 11 to 23 in Europe. 23 to 25 in New Zealand. 25 to 33 in Europe. 33 to 37 in New Zealand. 37 to 38 in Europe. 38 to 48 in New Zealand. 48 to 52 in Europe. I hope you're following this. 52 to 63 back in New Zealand. 63 to 66 in Europe. 67 to 69 in New Zealand and 69 to 73 back in Europe. And by Europe, generally we mean France. Uh, he did study, he did live and work in England, but mostly in France. His pattern um, when he was in France was to spend uh, summers in Brittany and winters in Provence, which is what we see behind us here. It's not a, it doesn't, it wasn't a, as regular as clockwork in that way, but that was the general pattern. That the, the Riviera was too hot in summer, but perfect in winter. Brittany was too cold in winter, but perfect in summer. So that was his, um, that was his style. Um, when he came back to New Zealand in 1923, he was treated uh, like a rock star. He was, he was simply the most famous painter uh, in, the, in, the, in the country, really. And there's plenty of evidence for that. Um, when he uh, came back, there was a large gathering of prominent Christchurch citizens, artists, and others at the city council chambers yesterday afternoon. I'm reading from the press, November 20, 1923. When a civic reception was tendered, Mr. Sidney Thompson, the New Zealand artist who was just returned to Christchurch after an absence of 12 years, um, the mayor said, Mr. Thompson was endowed with artistry and had developed his powers by hard work. He had become a pride not only to the city but to the whole dominion. The artist's kindly nature and attractive personality had made him beloved to all who knew him. There were still many years ahead and perhaps his greatest work was still to be done. The mayor had very great pleasure in welcoming Mr. Thompson back to New Zealand and hoped that his stay would prove longer than was anticipated and then in parentheses, mm -hmm. loud applause. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so he was a rock star. He, was, wow. he, really, he really was. Uh, and um, uh, all, uh, the same, a similar thing happened in 1932 when he came back again. I'm really intrigued to know what happened when he came back again in 1952. Unfortunately, papers passed, which we rely on for all this information, hasn't got up to 1952 yet. It's still protected. So uh, soon, or I could dig it out manually, but I'm not going to. It would be great to know whether in 1952 he had the same uh, rock star reception. And the reason I mention that is because of the changes that had happened in, uh, in New Zealand in, in that time. Um, he always had great sales. He always had, it would appear that uh, his, his work was always very, very saleable. It was uh, respected by the critics, but also uh, uh, eminently sellable. Uh, always sunny, literally and figuratively. Um, but 19, the 1930s, I, I can't give you a history of I can't give you a history of New Zealand art uh, in in this length of time. But in the 1930s, there was this enormous change and the and the general rise of uh, of, a, of a feeling of nationalism in literature and poetry and in painting, of course, and the uh, the move away from depicting. Uh, 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 old world scenes, whether they really were in the old world in France and Britain, or whether they were old world interpretations of what you found in New Zealand. And so uh, uh, through the 1920s, I think it's fair to say that his, the, the Frenchness was slightly, it was sort of exotic and a bit sexy and, and uh, extremely appealing, and he got this, this, these rave reviews. By the 1930s, this is a simplification, so don't don't bag me for that. But by the 1930s, the uh, the, the mood it would appear had changed. You could put this down to you know the depression or something. But by the 1930s, the mood had certainly changed, and we can quote uh, uh, various people: Leonard Booth and Alan Kernow, the poet. Uh, by 1930, uh, Leonard Booth was saying. Sidney Thompson is not a painter of New Zealand subjects. He's a French painter of French, in, of French subjects. He is imbued with ideas of the French painters since the post-impressionists. Uh, Alan Kernow, this is now 1950, uh, really laid into him, a pupil of Van der Velden is still with us in Sidney Thompson. He might have learned no more from the Dutchman than how to hold a brush for all that can be observed in the characteristic work of both painters 
Other influences supervened in Mr. Thompson's case, chiefly French, with some imperfectly fitted lendings from the post-impressionists to produce a strangely disoriented, heavily sugared mode, mm. much surface glamour, oh. but rhythmically dull against the brilliance with which the subject has been painted away. Ouch. Now it is a simple, yeah, ouch, as you so rightly say. Uh, it is a simplification, but uh, the fact is that uh, what he, the, the rock star treatment waned. That's why I'm quite interested to see whether it waned even more, uh, because he was, uh, you know, seriously uh, out of fashion by uh, by that time. Um, I can only the, the person who is it all in our hearts today is Julie King, who wrote the the book and created a marvelous exhibition, and you all know her, I'm sure. Uh, she um, uh, is. Is such a powerful force in my in the way I've been uh, thinking about this, um, and if, uh, I reread this book for this little talk. It's simply the most marvelous read. It's uh, it's moderate and it's considered and it's faultlessly uh, footnoted, and the bibliography is just a, a dream to, to work with. I can't recommend it highly enough. Uh, it's long out of print, but it, it has been digitised and it is on our website if you do want to read it cover to cover. It, it, it's easy to get if you go to a, book a second-hand bookshop. You'll, you'll find copies uh, floating around quite easily. Um, okay, so now let's talk quickly about the scene. Uh, what we, that, that was Sidney Love Thompson and the history of New Zealand art in, in five minutes. So uh, five minutes on the scene itself. So this is Grasse, so uh, inland from Cannes in the south of France. And of course, most uh, famous now as a center of the perfume industry. Um, uh, this canal, it, it isn't really a canal in the English sense of a canal that barges would go along. It's really a water supply uh, channel, and uh, it's still there. Um, we have, uh, it was opened in 1868, and it was paid for and uh, the big instigator behind it was uh, Lord Brougham, who in fact developed Cannes as a resort. Uh, he went there for his uh, summer holidays, or maybe his winter holidays. Um, it's 42 kilometres long, and um, the, it supplied water to all these little villages and to, and to the big developing resort town of Cannes itself down on the coast. Um, what I've been trying to do, oh yes, and at that point, the perfume industry turned from being a very small sort of cottage industry, individual farmers, to being a huge sort of industrial thing with fields of violets and jasmine and so on, which you can still uh, see there today. Um, we've spent a, I've spent a lot of time in the last few weeks trying to identify exactly where this house is, and uh, I'm afraid it's, it's beaten me, despite the assistance of Mr. Chambon, who is the president of the Association for the Safe Sauvegarde of the Signe and its canal. Oh, it's called the Canal de la Signe. The Signe is a river, and this is the Canal de la Signe. We cannot exactly identify this, this, uh, this house at all, and if anyone can, but it's on their website, and all the people in Glass are busy looking and trying <laughs> to work out exactly which house it is. Glass has totally changed. It's now all big apartment blocks, and the house may well not be there. Um, you might think that the curve of the canal and the shape of that bridge, I th when I saw it, I thought, oh, that'll be so distinctive. But it turns out that every bridge over the canal, and there are hundreds of them, is shaped like that. Because the canal is on the side of a hill, uh, the upside is always high and the downside is always low. It follows the contour. So every bridge has that uh, asymmetric shape. So that's no clue, unfortunately, either. Um, the, this, the association that I've been dealing with, are they are doing a lot of work to prevent the canal being uh, put underground into pipes, uh, which is what people want to do, because then you have more land to build more, build more expensive houses on. So uh, a, a lot of it, it has disappeared into underground pipes. The flow of water is still the same, but the uh, undergrounding has, um, uh, means that a lot of it's not there. There's one, there's one other funny little uh, thing that I'll say is that um, some sources say that the name of the house is the Campagne Lamilou. So that's great. Well, we know the name of the house, but the, Gra the Grasse Archive Office can't help us with that. Um, the problem with Googling or researching Milou 
and Thompson is oh. that uh, can you can you see where this is going? <laughs> Milou is the French for Snowy, the Tintin's dog, and of course Thompson is a character in Tintin. <laughs> oh. So if you Google Milou and Thompson, you have a thousand Tintin-related uh, responses to, uh, to to sift through before you, before you get to the um, before you get to the real thing. So if you can tell us where it is, we'd absolutely love to know, and um, I, there will be people around who could, who could do that. We just need to connect connect with them and. Uh, find out. Oh, he painted many, I'll leave some of these things out, but he painted many other scenes of grass, including other scenes of this canal. Um, I, uh, well, I wonder if I can do this for people at home. That's that one there. And that's that one there. And these are from a Dunbar Sloan catalogue 2011. So there are other uh, images from this same garden of a house that he owned. I haven't made that clear, have I? That no. He bought this house. It wasn't a rental house. Uh, he bought this house and lived in, owned it and lived in it for 10 years or so and painted many scenes. So we have quite a few angles to go at to try and triangulate the actual location of the house, but we haven't done it. So it wasn't poorly he, he, his career. Uh, I've just been asked uh, whether uh, whether uh, he was uh, poor. I, I don't think he was. I think his sales were were prolific. Uh, I I have never uh, researched this in detail, but I get the feeling that he lived well. He wasn't a millionaire, but I think he lived comfortably. He could afford to travel backwards and forwards to Europe. He had a lot of sales. Remember, he uh, he when he came back in the twenties and thirties. He sold a lot of works to uh, art galleries and to private individuals. He went. He had exhibitions in Australia, and he sold works to the Art Gallery of New South Wales and the um, National Gallery of Victoria. They've all got Sydney Thompsons. They haven't got anything by Rita Angus, either of them, but they've both got Sydney Thompsons that were bought in that uh, period in the 1920s. Did he have a following in France? I've, I've just been asked whether he had a, a following in France, and the question to that is absolutely yes. There were many, many exhibitions of his work, uh, especially in uh, Concarno. There was a, a big ret retrospective, as well as several smaller shows of his in uh, in the uh, right through to the end of his life, through to the 60s, 70s. He died in 1973, aged 96. So right through to the end of his life, he was um, he was painting and uh, exhibiting. Uh, in, uh, in in France, absolutely, yeah. And I think, well, this is a bit of a stretch, but I mean, I think many French people would consider him a Concarno painting, and uh, if you read the catalogues of some of those shows, he's somebody who lived and worked in, in Brittany, and that was his, that was his milieu. I come then, finally, to the life of this particular painting. So it was in the... Uh, 1920, uh, the 1934 uh, <coughs> exhibition at the CSA, and I will just show that to the uh, people at home. Uh, this I've just digitised this as well, so you can look at this online. This is the CSA's own copy of the sales catalogue, and uh, it's uh, it has handwritten notes in it to say who bought various paintings, and there are some names in there that we uh, that you you may recognise. Uh, and it was a big show, and the paintings were jolly expensive, and a lot of them sold. So I think we can say that it funded his next uh, bout of travel uh, perfectly satisfactorily. Um, he exhibited this, therefore, in that show in 1934, so it obviously travelled out with him from France. Uh, it didn't sell. I mean, now, now we're in, in slightly uh, speculative as to why it didn't sell, whether they wanted to hold on to it. Um, but it remained uh, in the hands of Annette Thompson, who was uh, Sydney's daughter, who also lived a very long life and only died a few years ago. Um, but anyway, it didn't, it didn't sell at that point, so it remained uh, with her. Uh, in 1990, or let's say in the 1980s, uh, as, as I've said before, uh, Julie King uh, worked on this uh, magnificent book and uh, retrospective exhibition. And uh, obviously, at that stage, dealt with Annette, uh, talking about her father's work. And um, Annette uh, offered Julie this painting. Um, and I can do no better than to finish by reading um, a comment from uh, Julie. 
Jenny's partner, uh, Julie's partner, Jenny, who is with us now. So I, I feel this is the most uh, touching thing I've ever done at one of these things. This is uh, what Jenny told me about how this painting reached us. As you know, the work was part of the travelling exhibition on Thompson that Julie did for the McDougall Gallery. It was sent with some others out here from France for that show. Annette insisted on giving that work to Julie. She would not accept it, of course. However, Annette was very insistent and Julie agreed to this with the condition that she would leave the work to the gallery as it had a significant role in the Sydney Love Thompson oeuvre. Of course, being a French work, it was less common here. That's certainly true. Annette made clear that it was a gift to Julie and she was to keep it for herself but that what she did with it was her decision. It was a personal work as you can tell by the title and that I haven't even mentioned that it's our house, our canal in Grasse so it's very much a, a, very much a personal thing. It's not just a view of Provence. It was a personal work as you can tell from the title and had remained part of their personal collection until Annette gave it to Julie. For the next six years after the earthquakes, while we settled insurance and moved an extraordinary number of times, the Thompson was the only work that tr always travelled with us. Julie always felt a huge responsibility to care for this particular work and leave it to the gallery. Mm. So we, God bless Julie, we miss her in so many ways yes. and we, not a week goes by that I don't wish I could talk to her about something or ask her something or pick her brains about something. So thank you very much, and we look forward to uh, another Art Bite in due course. Thank you. Thank you so much.